Hi everybody, Vera Samad here, and today I want to talk about how ketogenic and carnivore diets can potentially ruin your kidney health. Now, if you've been on such a diet and you have noticed the development of eye bag discoloration underneath your eyes, well, stick around because I'm going to explain how that is associated with kidney impairment, and it's a result of it consuming too much cooked meat. Now, everything I'm about to say here doesn't apply to raw meat consumption. It only applies to cooked meat consumption. So in traditional Chinese medicine, the eye bags that develop are associated with kidney stress or kidney impairment. And it doesn't only have to be cooked meat which causes this. Any kind of uh, strain on the kidneys would cause these eye bags to develop. For example, doing too much drugs or excessive caffeine consumption or lack of sleep would cause these kinds of eye bags to develop. But I'm going to explain why consuming too much cooked beef causes this to develop. And I'm going to do it through two different angles. I'm going to do it first through a nutritional perspective. And second, I'm going to do it through a historical perspective. So first, through a nutritional perspective. We know that cooking meat causes the, ur the purines to turn into uric acid crystals. And consuming too much of this stuff causes the uric acid to be deposited within the body and then finally it ends up in the kidneys where it's supposed to be excreted. But of course, consuming this stuff day in, day out, eventually the body's not able to metabolize and detoxify it properly and it just ends up lodging in the kidneys and uh, causing kidney impairment. Thus the eye bags develop. Further, when you cook meat, you're killing the beneficial bacteria and enzymes which help aid in its digestion. You are also killing the hormones in the meat itself, the natural hormones, which are supposed to replenish your own hormonal reserves and give you energy. And recall that every single wild creature in nature obtains hormones from a raw food diet, whether it be a herbivorous animal or a carnivorous animal, they're all eating 100% raw food and that's where they get their energy from. But when you cook a food, you kill the hormone content. And so that's why even people who go on carnivore and ketogenic diets still most often are in need of coffee and even testosterone replacement therapy because they're not getting it from the meat. Further, cooking the meat, because it makes it much more difficult to digest, because you're killing the beneficial bacteria and enzymes, it requires your body to produce far more hydrochloric stomach acid to digest it, meaning it causes further adrenal and thyroid output because hydrochloric acid is produced by the power of the adrenal glands and the thyroid. So imagine you're eating a food which constantly depletes your own hormonal in, your hormonal reserves, but gives you none in return. And it doesn't matter if you're on a cooked vegan diet or cooked carnivore diet, this is one of the reasons why so many people are going through uh, infertility today. There's many reasons, but this is one of the reasons there's no more raw food in the diet. Another part, the cherry on top of this nutritional science, the nutritional perspective on raw versus cooked meat, is Dr. Pottinger's work on cats. And I'm just gonna summarize it really quick because it's extremely significant work done in the field of nutritional science. Dr. Pottinger was a physician who in the 1930s conducted experiments on cats. He worked on over 900 cats over a span of 10 years. And in summation, he gave one group cooked meat and the other group raw meat. And he observed what took course. The group which was given cooked meat developed allergies, uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, went through various assortments of physical degeneration, uh, had extreme lethargy, fatigue, and within the second generation of cooked meat cats, uh, they began to have basically what equates to modern gender dysphoria. The male cats weren't acting like masculine cats and the female cats weren't acting like female cats. There was a gender role reversal amongst the cats. It's because they weren't receiving the hormones they needed. By the third generation of cooked cats, they were all too sick to reproduce. The bloodlines would terminate and they were completely infertile. So this is significant work. On the other hand, the cats which were fed raw meat reproduced successively generation after generation without any health issues at all and sustained optimum health. Amazing book, look into it, Dr. Pottinger's works on cats, a study in nutrition. So now let's look at this through a historical perspective and does, can this apply to humans? And I wrote a book about this called The Disease of Kings, where I basically correlate all of the science that I just explained, and I correlate it to the rise and fall of civilizations. As a historian, I was always very interested in why nomadic people from the far north 
would always come and conquer the settled civilizations of the cell. And as I learned about nutritional sciences, it put the puzzle together. I realized that the people emerging from the far north in the Eurasian steppe, which at various times housed an assortment of different races and ethnicities, so it's not about one race dominating another, but it's about superior nutritional nourishment, uh, aiding a people to dominate another. But anyways, I digress. What I found was that these semi-nomadic people from the Eurasian steppe in the far north would subsist off of a diet which uh, subsisted primarily off of raw food and it was in the form of raw dairy, 70% raw dairy, the organs were consumed raw and only the muscle meat was consumed cooked. And these people would sustain optimum health and fertility just like Dr. Pottinger's raw food cats. And they would migrate south and go to war, conquer and dominate the people of subtle civilization in India, Persia, Sumer, Egypt, Greece and so on. And these people of settled culture did not subsist on raw food, but on predominantly cooked food. So these nomads would come in, conquer them. They were just physically bigger, much more intelligent, much stronger, much faster, and much more keen in warfare. They'd come and conquer them, and then they would integrate into the settled cultures of Southern civilization. And they would adopt settled manners, settled customs, and settled lifestyle. They'd integrate into that way of life and adopt the food even. And within several generations, these raw food nomadic conquerors would also undergo the same type of physical, intellectual, and spiritual decline and degeneration of the previous people that they had conquered. And what would happen is that they in turn would be conquered by a fresh wave of raw food nomads. Now I document this in my book, The Disease of Kings. It's absolutely fascinating. You see this constantly recurring in Oriental history, in the, in, in the history of Asia. Raw food nomads emerging from the north, conquering settled cultures, becoming sophisticated and civilized, adopting the manners of cooked food and cooked meats and uh, cooked doughs with spices and herbs and oils. In time, they undergo physical degeneration and they're just, again, conquered by a new wave of nomads. It's fascinating work. Now, also through an anthropological perspective, there has never really been a culture which subsisted on high amounts of cooked meats not long-term at least. Uh, for example, the only cultures I know of which consumed primarily meat for their cuisines were people like the Nanette and the Inuit who reside in the very far north, the far northern hemisphere. The Nanette are in far northern Russia, the Inuit are in far north Canada and Alaska. And they consume raw walrus, or raw seal, raw whale meat, and raw caribou meat. They consume almost all of their meat raw. Um, aside from that, you have people like the Maasai, but they are on a primarily raw milk diet. It's like 70, 80% raw milk with some raw organs and blood and then cooked muscle meat. The only place where you find high amounts of cooked meat consumption is in settled cultures and civilizations. So again, India, Persia, Sumer, Greece, Rome, Egypt. And what you find was that the consumption of cooked meat was, uh, delegated only for the aristocracy. The peasants or the majority of people were forbidden from consuming meat or hunting game. Uh, they were outlawed from it and they were forced to consume primarily grains and vegetation. And it's funny because we have something similar today with the food pyramid where everyone's forced to consume a sugar, caffeine, grain and coffee diet. But anyway, what we find historically is that as the aristocracy subsisted, subsisted primarily on cooked meat, they would develop diseases different to the peasants who were consuming primarily cooked grains. The peasants wouldn't develop properly. They weren't strong or intelligent, uh, but they'd have assortments of diseases which were very similar to the autoimmune disorders of today. And I think it's due to the uh, intestines coming apart, of course, from just consuming too much grains and not having enough protein and fat. Conversely, the aristocracy always suffered from gout disease. Gout disease was so unique and specific to the aristocracy that uh, it became to be known as the disease of kings. And that's why I titled my book that name, The Disease of Kings, because again, I document how the consumption of cooked meat always was an issue for the aristocracy and how eventually not only did it lead to, their, to the decline of their physical health, but to the de decline of their entire empire which would be in time conquered by raw food nomads who consumed lots of raw meat and raw milk and who did not suffer the same types of 
physical Im, uh, impairments or the decline of their in, in, intellect, health, and vigor due to overconsumption of cooked foods. Now again, the initial symptoms of gout are things like excessive thirst, dehydration, the onset of lethargy and fatigue, uh, eye bags developing around the circle. These are the initial phases of gout and um, in older age, it leads to of course just total body inflammation and pain and angst in the joints and ligaments because the uric acid crystals are just so corrosive on the body. So although we can tolerate cooked meat better than any other cooked food, cooked grains, vegetation, legumes, etc. It is not optimal. We can only tolerate it so well because again, meat is the primary food for human nourishment. And the consumption of raw food really is not something so taboo. There's indigenous cultures all around the world who incorporate some type of raw cuisine, some type of raw meat dish into their diets. And again, I document this in my book, The Disease of Kings, uh, about these warrior cultures all around the world and something which they share in common in their cuisines was the addition of some form of raw meat, some type of raw meat dish. For example, the samurai had the, um, uh, the consumption of high amounts of raw horse meat and raw fish. The um, Germans had the consumption of steak tartare. The uh, Mongols, Turks, and Aryans of the Asian steppe consumed blood and raw blood and raw milk products. So raw animal foods are extremely important in maintaining optimum health uh, and developing optimum physical development in developing the brain to its fullest potential and in uh, achieving the, the longest possible longevity we have available to us. I hope you all enjoyed the video. I have my book on this subject linked in the description. I am a polymath and a regenerative farmer with expertise in many areas. Please like, subscribe, and leave your comments below. Thank you and have a nice day.